Let's continue with the uh, discussion that we had yesterday. So I'm, I'm going to move to, uh, to the next example of uh, cage redundancy, and then it will be clear where are we going, OK, with this. OK, I mean, the first, thir first target. OK, so uh, one example of a in very interesting uh, uh, field uh, that again exhibits uh, gauge redundancy is uh, an anti-symmetric uh, field with two anti-symmetric indices, okay? So a two form. Um, so again, this is sort of a generalization of Maxwell. So Maxwell was one form. And now we are generalizing it with two indices, so it's a two-form. And um, uh, the story just uh, repeats itself, almost. Uh, so we introduce a field strength for this uh, object, uh, very similar to the field strength of the, of in the case that we had in the case of Maxwell. Um, so in the case of Maxwell, the field strength was a two-form. And was an exterior derivative, right? Of, it was anti-symmetrized derivative of, of a one form. So we follow the same thing, same path. So we anti-symmetrize uh, the uh, derivative, okay, of a uh, diminutive field. Um, so as uh, again, it's a direct generalization of Maxwell's uh, field strength. And um, okay, we want to build a theory that would describe a massless a two form, okay? And uh, we just follow the same steps and as in, in, in the case of Maxwell, uh, we write down the square of this uh, anti-symmetrized uh, derivative, okay? Of a, of, a, of a three form, so in this case it's a three form. Now, uh, it's convenient to put here combinatoric factors, okay? So w one over th three factorial, uh, twice three factorial, and so on. Because w once I take variation because of anti-symmetric properties, so assume that they are there, okay? Because I don't want to carry around all these factors that are irrelevant. W when they become relevant, I will uh, display them explicitly. So, uh, so every time there is some factor here, so uh, and that you can think in the following way: every time I go to next equation, I always rescale my quantities in such a way that there is always one in front. Okay. Uh, uh, now, it, you, okay, for, it's good to do once with these factorials. You can do it as an exercise, of course, to to, uh, to keep all the comp combinatoric factors. Um, but they are just for convenience, of course. So this is the action of a free uh, field, uh, the menu, uh, anti-symmetrized, anti-symmetric field, two form, uh, kinetic term, and it can also it, it can also couple to a source. Okay. Now, so we want to investigate this theory. Okay. First, we want to understand what kind of, uh, what does it describe, how many degrees of freedom does it propagate, and so on, right? So again, we go to the equation of motion. The equation of motion is, again, pretty similar to, to, to Maxwell. And again, taking the divergence of this equation of motion, of course, source has to be anti-symmetric, obviously. Taking divergence, we can see that source has to be conserved, okay? So again, the source has to satisfy uh, conservation. Okay. Very good. So now this theory, just like Maxwell, exhibits gauge redundancy. Okay. So what kind of gauge redundancy? Um, let's say. Let's write it here. So we can rep we can shift B menu by an anti-symmetrized derivative of a, of a vector, okay? So, so psi nu is a vector, okay? So gauge transformation vector. 
Now, if you think of psi mu as a, as, as, as a vector, then essentially this shift is nothing but the field strength for psi, which I can denote by psi mu nu anti-symmetric. Okay? So psi mu nu is basically generalization, is literally a Maxwell field strength, but for the gauge parameter psi. Okay? So psi is not a field, it's a gauge parameter. Okay? Um, now, um, so immediately you can notice the following thing, that there is a uh, story with the redundancy of the redundancy. Because since, uh, since psi enters through its field strength, oh, psi is not a field, but it enters through, through analog of the, of the Maxwell field strength, uh, psi itself can be shifted right, by a derivative of uh, a scalar. And this shift is not reflected on uh, B menu, okay? Right? Again, we can now repeat literally what we did with Maxwell, in, in the case of Maxwell, okay? Um, we want to make this equation pleasant, okay? So something in, in uh, nicely invertible. Uh, by, by fixing the gauge to see how many degrees of freedom we have there, meanwhile, okay? Uh, so, it's useful to again go into the gauge in which uh, B mu nu is divergence free, and uh, again we can do this because if I start with B mu nu, which has non-zero divergence, I can perform a gauge shift and go to B mu nu, which I shift by, by And so the new B menu can always satisfy the condition that is divergence free. Why? Because this is just simply, okay, this is simply a Maxwell equation for the transformation parameter. Think of it as a source of the Maxwell equation, okay? Now, how many degrees of freedom do, do I kill in this way? So, so I, I, now I, I achieve this condition. So how many degrees of freedom? Four. Four. Uh, um, okay, let's see, right? Because look, how, what is the power that I explore in this uh, uh, transformation parameter, extract from this transformation parameter? As, as we said, transformation parameter itself, because it exhibits gauge redundancy, in fact, I can choose the gauge for this transformation parameter itself. For instance, I can make it divergence free, right? Uh, then, this equation will be simply box of uh, xi nu, right? Uh, the source. Now, since I'm making transformation parameter divergence free, this means that I'm eliminating one degree of freedom from this transformation parameter. So one degree of freedom is useless. I cannot use it to kill the, uh, to kill the corresponding, to do anything with it, okay? Right? So therefore, uh, with, with this I'm killing three. Right? So three, why? Because the three are the, the off-shell degrees of freedom, the, the, the complete uh, power of off-shell degrees of freedom that a vector transformation parameter can carry, okay? Sorry? Yeah, if I, this is, this is this equation in this gauge. Okay, so I can, I, I just gave it as an example, I don't have to do it, but I said, you can al al already uh, guess from here, because ga gauge transformation parameter itself is subject of redundancy. Okay, and this means that the one degree of freedom in this gauge transformation parameter is not active for, for, for uh, reducing the uh, propagating number of de uh, degrees of freedom in B mu nu. Okay, is this clear? You can also, of course, <laughs> achieve the, this from direct counting because B mu nu is anti-symmetric. Not all of them, not all the components are independent. That's why this, this equation is not really four conditions, it's actually three. You can do it as a count, okay? But the shortcut is, we can see it immediately from here. So this kills three degrees of freedom, okay? And uh, so we are left with, uh, so to start with, how many would be there? Anti-symmetric two form? Six, right? So six mi minus three, we, we are left with three. And 
We, then we continue the same story as in Maxwell. There is again a residual, there is again a residual symmetry, okay, with the shift of uh, uh, with with the, with, this, with the shift of uh, xi parameter, which satisfies uh, which is harmonic, right? Okay. So and that has exactly the same power as Maxwell's two degrees of freedom. Okay. So therefore, using that, I can kill I can kill two more, and I'm left with one. Okay, so one, we cannot do anything with one. So one remains. So what does this mean? Okay, so this means that we have a theory of a massless field. Okay, it carries two indices, but who cares uh, how many indices, in the indices it carries? The, the number of independent components is one. Okay, propagating deg degrees of freedom one. So there is a field with one propagating degree of freedom. Okay. Now we have to match these two representations of the Poincaré group. Okay. Now the only thing is a scalar. Okay. So this must be uh, spin zero. Yeah. It's the same thing because now I, I I have to solve the equation with a source, right? I use power inside to use the, to solve this equation with source. But I can still shift xi itself by xi prime as long as xi prime satisfies this equation, okay? And this I can use to kill extra two degrees of freedom on shell. So I'm killing three right away. These are gauge degrees of freedom, and the other two I'm killing on shell. Okay, so this re this leaves me with one propagating degree of freedom. All right. Okay. So it's a scalar. This object. <coughs> Very good. So now uh, this means that somehow, if it's a scalar, um, we should be able to write it as a scalar. Okay. Right. So we have to perform, to do this, we can do this, no problem. Uh, to do this, we have to perform what is called a duality transformation, okay? Now, how do we perform duality transformation? We started with this Lagrangian, okay, so let me do it for a free field. We, we get back to the sources later, okay? So I have a free field, free Lagrangian. Okay, so now what I want to do, so w when I was getting this, uh, when I was studying the theory, the degree of freedom, the, uh, with respect to which I'm doing uh, functional derivative, when I got this equation of motion, I did functional derivative with respect to b mu nu, right? So this, right? I, I did variation with respect to b mu nu. Uh, now here what I will do, I will not do variation with respect to b mu nu. I declare f itself as the variable, okay? All right, so I, ha I consider f as a variable, okay? And I do functional derivative with respect to f. Now, if I do that, I will get from this, from this section, I get simply uh, nothing interesting, that uh, f is identically zero, right? Okay? Why? Uh, because I didn't use the entire information about f. So f is not just any anti-symmetric three form. f is a very special one, which is an exterior derivative of someone. Okay. So f is an uh, anti-symmetric derivative of b mu nu. Okay. Now, when I do variation with respect to b mu nu, this information is of course encoded. Right? So I don't do, I have to do anything else. But if I do variation with respect to f, I somehow have to take, take into account this fact, right? So, and I have to take into account through Lagrange multiplier. Okay, so in other words, because this is an exterior derivative, it satisfies the constraint. Right? Oops, sorry. Um, and um, and vice versa, okay? And therefore, um, I have to include this constraint 
in this action through a Lagrange multiplier. Okay? Now, the Lagrange multiplier has to multiply this constraint, right? But this constraint carries four indices. It's a scalar. The constraint itself is a scalar. So Lagrange multiplier should carry the same number of indices as the constraint, right? And so therefore, Lagrange multiplier must be scalar. So therefore, I have to introduce a scalar object, A, OK, and impose this constraint. Sorry. OK? Now, now when I do function, when I perform functional uh, derivative with respect to, with respect to uh, A, I get this equation, right? And when I perform it with respect to uh, F, I get equation. Again, assume that there is a confinatory factor, which gives me 1, OK? Plus. Uh, <laughs> like this. Okay. Okay, so now uh, now it's trivial. We just we can directly integrate out f and plug it here in this equation, right? And what we get is obvious. If I take it, plug it there, I will get uh, okay a product of two epsilon tensors, okay, with the same indices, right? So we get something like mu alpha beta gamma. The surface term is, is up here, right? Sorry. There is a surface term, right, to, to get this uh, equation. So is it just in this zero? I mean, to get this zero. Yeah. At this point, yeah. These are. Which equation? You mean? You mean? Uh, no, this is just a constraint. Yeah, this is constraint, but to get this uh, equation, to basically uh, vary with respect to f mu nu. Uh, yeah. We will have to introduce a surface term, right? No, I don't have to. Why, why should I introduce the, the surface term? But uh, you, whenever I need the surface term, I can assume that this is included. That's, uh, no, no, that's absolutely not a problem. So yeah, you have this equation. We integrate it out. <coughs> Sorry, we integrate it out and plug it back now. Um, here, in fact, we can even so to pl to integrate to solve one equation and plug it into the other is always okay. But here, it's also okay to integrate out f and plug it back into the action. Why? Because the we are in the special case when the 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 action is bilinear in the fields. Okay. So in general, if action is not bilinear in the fields, you cannot do it. All right. Okay. Um, but here, in fact, you can, you can even do that. But um, we don't need to plug it back into the action because this is, this is the equation we get. And so this equation describes a propagation of a, uh, of a scalar. OK? Any questions so far? Yeah. Yeah. No, the surface terms in this business will be extremely important, as you will see. Because there's instantons around. Uh, well, here there are no instantons. You see, let's, 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 let's go step by step. Yes, when we use this, uh, this story for, we will use it, that's where I'm going. I'm going to QCD, uh, to Axion, to, to describe the generation of the mass of the eta prime and generation of the mass of the Axion in this language. There, of course, we will need surface terms left and right, okay? But at this point, I'm just introducing a BB new field. I don't know uh, anything about the quantization of its sources. Just simply writing down a free theory of a BB new field, okay? And trying to do duality transformation on a free BB new field. All right. So at this point, we, we, we are there. Yeah. Surface terms will be extremely important in the, in the, in the, in the very shortly. Yeah, if I take, if I, if I, no, there are two equations, right? So this is a equation of motion for, yeah, where to write it. This equation, this equation. This is equation of motion for F, right? When I did variation with respect to F, okay? This is equation of motion for F, this is equation of motion for A. 
Uh, is a Lagrange multiplier. So I solve equation of motion for f and I plug it here in this equation, okay? And so this gives me box A equals zero, all right? <coughs> now this, um, this transformation, let's see. Um, yeah, so as we'll, as we'll see, the similar, similar dual transformations we can generalize to different, to different uh, anti-symmetric forms, okay? And um, so in this particular case, we got a uh, relation between uh, B mu nu and A. Now, um, so from now on, w let's 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 make a target. Okay, where are we going with this? So fir first, let's summarize. Wh what are we getting from here? So we had the theory of uh, an anti-symmetric two-form, which exhibited gauge redundancy. Okay, or gauge symmetry, if you want. All right. And we dualize this theory to a theory of a scalar, a free scalar. So the symmetry that is exhibited by a free scalar is a shift symmetry. There is nothing else there. Okay. So, so the gauge redundancy somehow got replaced by a shift symmetry. Okay. As we will see, uh, the uh, this type of transformations al also will change other things. For instance, sources which are topological or magnetic with respect to A, they become electric. Okay, or not other sources with respect to B, and so on. Okay. But now, where I'm where I'm going with this? Okay, so I want to understand the question of mass generation. So in other words, what happens if I generate mass on one side, how can I describe this mass generation in the language in, on the other side? Okay, now why? Because um, we have many exa several examples of the uh, scalars with uh, uh, shift symmetries which are explicitly broken. Okay, for example, uh, pseudo Goldstone bosons, uh, axions, or explicitly, yes. But what, 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 we don't care about making how this explicitly broken. Well, that's what we care about. That's the important thing we want to understand. How we can explicitly break this. Yeah, how first, how, how this explicit breaking happens, whether this explicit breaking is a, is, is a, uh, what's the physical meaning of this explicit breaking, and how can I understand this explicit breaking in the language of gauge redundancy? Okay, right. And uh, so, two important applications that I will discuss will be um, a mass generation of eta prime meson in QCD and mass generation of the axion. Okay. So, in both cases, there is a, a shift symmetry, a global shift symmetry in one description with them. There is global shift, shift symmetry, which is um, broken spontaneously okay and explicitly okay so in the standard picture that's what happens the symmetry is broken explicitly and softly by instantons okay in both cases okay in cases of um, uh, axion in case of eta prime okay so this is on one side and i want to ask the question whether we can understand this mass generation in the gauge language okay Other questions? Okay, so now, therefore, I will focus my attention on the Goldstone type fields, okay, the Goldstone boson type fields. So I will assume that the, there is an effective low energy description, okay, 
In some cases, we may know also the UV completion of this theory, okay? For instance, in the case of Axion, we know the ultraviolet completion of the theory, there is no problem. And there is a, uh, so in these notations, A is canonically normalized. It has dimensionality which is canonically normalized, right? Because it has one derivative acting on F. Uh, so, uh, dimensionless quantity, which will correspond to the phase degree of freedom, because I'm talking about Goldstone bosons, right? Uh, will be A divided by certain scale FA, okay? For in the case of Axion, this will be uh, Axion decay constant, all right? So this is some kind of phase degree of freedom. We can call it uh, little phi. And so if you are considering uh, Goldstone bosons, uh, of course, physics should be periodic, OK, with a certain period, which should be uh, uh, for A, the period is set by FA, and dimensionless uh, quantity must be periodic, modulo, at least modulo 2 pi, OK? Okay, so let's see, see, let's give an example of this type of story. You, 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 you know everything about Axion, right? About, about Peche Queen symmetry, right? So in the case of uh, Peche Queen symmetry, we know how to generate mass for this type of object. For instance, I can, even you we complete this theory, I can introduce a field phi, Literally, like a Higgs field that we introduced in the, the, in the previous lecture, except I, I don't gauge this U1 symmetry, right? All right, and um, we write down a, a, th a theory for this, Lagrangian. So this could be literally like Peche Quinn field. The, we, you, you, you know what it is. Uh, so we write down Lagrangian. Let's say some so this Lagrangian would give me uh, a standard uh, Mexican head uh, potential so this would be symmetry so it would be a symmetry under which Phi goes to I uh, what was the shift that we discussed there okay constant with this so alpha Phi let's say Okay, and this symmetry is spontaneously broken because there is this Mexican head uh, potential story, right? And we have a uh, we have a Goldstone boson. So at low energies, I can freeze rho, the the modulus of phi. I can freeze modulus to uh, fa, and there is a Goldstone massless Goldstone boson. So a, a low energy effective theory coming from here from this Lagrangian, right, would be, let's write it, let's write it here, would be simply a, a massless scalar, okay, shift, shift invariant massless scalar, okay. Now, uh, how do we generate the, 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 the mass for this uh, Goldstone boson? We, ex we have to explicitly break uh, global symmetry, global U1 symmetry, okay? So introduce some terms in the Lagrangian that explicitly break the symmetry. Uh, for instance, here we can introduce a term which is, let's say, linear in phi. Okay? Now, this term, we don't have to introduce it by hand. Ah, this is wet, so this is nice. Now, of course, we can put it by hand if you simply want to generate mass for a for a pseudo for a goldstone. In this case, goldstone becomes a pseudo goldstone. Okay, this object would generate a, uh, to, to the leading order at low energy theory would generate some kind of a potential for this, and we can add an appropriate constant to normalize the the, the bottom to, to to zero. 
and you will get, you will get a potential of the form 1 minus cosine of a over f okay from here right i just plug this form i freeze row and okay this linear term will give me some 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 cosine type potential okay uh, now you can do it by hand no, there is no problem okay so or whatever physics can generate it now for in the case of axion there is a source that, that generates this this uh, this breaking so uh, what is the source the source is the coupling of the Petschewin field to quarks to some of the quarks okay for instance in this toy model you, we can introduce a, a single fermion we can add to the story a single fermion okay now this this transformation that i perform on phi this this symmetry right this symmetry transformation this exon so i have a symmetry transformation with phi going into i alpha uh, uh, i alpha phi and uh, fermions transforming chirally okay through gamma 5 this is in dirac basis <coughs> if you want to write down in uh, this is the same thing as psi L bar, psi R plus Hermitian conjugated, okay? So in vial basis, so Dirac fermion, as you know, is, uh, contains two vial fermions, okay? So I can write them in the basis left and right. I can write also both, both of them in the left-handed basis, that's perfectly fine, okay? Um, and so, so there is a chiral transformation. There is a transformation that acts chirally on these fermions, okay? Um, and this, so if these fermions are colored, so let's say if I, in, in QCD, if I introduce, uh, if psi is a quark, okay, which carries uh, color, so then this is one flavor of, the, of quarks. And this term will be generated from the top determinant. So you, there is... A, You know, now the fact that this is wet. So this term is generated from top determinant. So you, you, so you know this, right? So that's the way the um, uh, the axion potential gets generated. Okay, in QCD. Any questions about this? Is this clear, or I'm saying something that you never heard? about so you you understand the meaning of this diagram that i uh, that i plotted so everything is, so we are we are fine okay so in other words there is a there is a top determinant which is generated okay at least by instantons okay so we know that instantons contribute there yeah, as was suggested by top long ago okay and uh, this is the way you can visualize the the generation of the linear term for phi Okay, so phi interacts with fermions, and fermions they uh, they t terminate on top determinant. Okay. Now, in this picture, if I take this picture, uh, the symmetry, this symmetry, U1 symmetry, uh, looks like it's explicitly broken by by whoever generates this top determinant. Okay. Uh, if if there are only instantons, then instantons. If there is something else, then plus that something else. Okay. And so, as a result of explicit breaking of the shift symmetry, we end up with the mass of the pseudo Goldstone boson. The the story with data it, so with axion story is okay you know you know with data prime is sort of similar we'll come back to it okay in more details all right but this this is the point so now the question is what happens to this duality in this picture okay in other words um, can I understand the mass generation of a pseudo Goldstone boson in the language of anti-symmetric two form, which means that understanding this in the language of gauge redundancy. All right. 
This is the question which we will try to answer at the moment. Then we will try to answer other questions. But okay. oh, is this clear? Where are we going? OK. Very good. Now, for this, we first have to understand first. So now we go step by step. First, we will try to understand how to generate masses for BMU nu. What are the ways uh, that we generate masses for, for BMU nu? And then how they are connected with the story of QCD and axion and, and mass generation of data prime. OK? OK, I need some space. Let's see. Um, can I erase this? That's the whole full thing. Top determinant in the case of one flavor is just psi bar psi. That's the, that's the, that's the thing. If, if I have more flavors, then not sure. So for instance, let's say, for instance, in, in standard Peche Queen scenario, with one generation, actually the one that was invented by Peche and Queen, right? Remember what they had? They had uh, uh, two Higgs doublets. Okay, let me only focus on neutral components of the Higgs doublets because the, the, the charge ones do, do not matter. So there was, there is a Higgs doublet for the up quarks, which is generating mass for the up quarks. Remember? Okay. And there was Higgs doublet for the down quarks, uh, f phi d, which was generating mass for the down quarks, right? Now, for Peche and Queen, this was necessary because in the standard model, with one Higgs, there is no chiral symmetry that they could use, okay? So, so if all the quarks have Yukawa coupling constants, then there is no chiral symmetry in the standard model. Now, if one of the quarks doesn't have Yukawa coupling constant, for, for instance, up quark, then of course there is a chiral symmetry. And then, of course, story is, is you don't need axion in that case. Why you don't need axion, by the way, as we will see, you still have axion in that case, except axion is eta prime itself. Okay, when, when quark, if, if one of the quarks is missing your coupling constant, okay, then uh, axion is eta prime, becomes eta prime, okay? So now, um, but okay, for the standard Peche Queen, well, this was the story, right? So, okay. Now the symmetry that, uh, w w so they needed to introduce two Higgs doublets, one for up quarks and one for down, down quarks, and in that case there is a chiral symmetry. Now what is the chiral symmetry? The chiral symmetry is that rotates up quark and down quark, is up, up doublet and down doublet differently, okay? So what, if you introduce them doublet, doublet, then differently. If you introduce them doublet, anti-doublet, then in the same way. So there is a relative phase rotation of, uh, of phi, okay? Let's say phi u and then uh, phi d, uh, phi d, or vice versa, depending whether you introduce them doublet or uh, anti doublet pot. Right? So in that case, top determinant, yeah, in this case, there you have now two flavors of quarks. And top determinant is always a determinant. Uh, so this diagram would become like this. Okay, and this, so here I have um, quarks, uh, up quark and down quarks. Okay, so now this would again generate the uh, product of two Higgs doublets, okay, and will break explicitly chiral symmetry. So for instance, if you, bo you both of them you introduce as, as doublets, right, then this will generate phi u dagger phi d, term in your Lagrangian, and of course this term immediately will generate something like this, okay? Now, of course, when you increase number of fermions, as you know, the, the factor n appears here, okay? Because there is a discrete symmetry, a discrete anomaly-free symmetry, okay? Right? So in general, if you have n flavors, then this vertex would contain n flavors. And then corresponding whatever, whatever is the peche queen field, you can always terminate it to this diagram, okay? All right, anything else? All right, so now, okay, now let's come back to, uh, I wanted to erase this, right? But actually I can use that one. So now let's generate mass for, for B menu, okay? Well, First we do something 
completely straightforward. Just add the mass term. The way we did for PROCA, OK? Now, I add the mass term, and I have to supplement this with tilde, because it's not the same field, of course, obviously, right? The, the, the one with, with the mass. Now I try to understand this theory, exactly as we did for the case of uh, Maxwell, OK? So equation of motion. Now gives me a constraint. Of course, there is no longer a gauge redundancy in this. In, for this, there is no longer say the same gauge redundancy. There is one, but not the same one. Okay. And um, so I can I cannot use gauge redundancy to eliminate any degrees of freedom. But there is a constraint, sim very similar to Proga constraint. Okay. If I take divergence of this equation, I will get. I will get a uh, I will get a constraint, okay? And that's it. So this kills three, okay? And we are left with three. Now it's very easy to understand wh where these three are coming from. It's exactly the same story because remember, uh, just as we did in case of Proca. Let me think of B mu nu as something which is smooth in the limit. I'm going to zero, okay? And therefore, if it, since it's smooth, by definition, it has two. Sorry, it has uh, one degree of freedom, and and a and a, a disymmetrized derivative of a vector. Okay, now I'm calling it f mu nu, not psi mu nu anymore, because I don't want to confuse with the gauge redundancy parameter. Where f mu nu is a field strength of a vector. Now, I am not calling it psi anymore, because, deliberately, because uh, the, the mo psi became a. What happened is that what was psi before now became a. So gauge redundancy parameter became a, a Stuckelberg field. Okay. So exactly the same thing happened as what happened in Maxwell. Okay. So when we try to deform our theory by adding a mass term, okay. So we thought that we broke gauge symmetry. Of course, in reality, nothing like this happened. In reality, what happened is that the gauge parameter now became a physical Stuckelberg field but continues to maintain exactly the same gauge redundancy as the old as, as this old degrees of freedom had obviously that's clear because now what happens now there is a, a gauge redundancy with this sorry sorry this is the other way around now there is a redundancy Who is, who is asking? Me. Yeah. I just took divergence of this equation. And since this is anti-symmetric, it's exactly the same thing as in Maxwell. Right? This is anti-symmetric, and so therefore this is automatically divergence free. And so I'm left with the divergence of this thing should be zero. How is they related to tilde and not tilde? Sorry, this guy is tilde, of course, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, I changed here and forgot to change there, right? This is tilde here, right? So whoever stands here should be divergence free. That's that's it. Whether we call it tilde or whatever, doesn't matter. So the, ten, the person that enters here is divergence free. But, um, so it satisfies the generalized Broca type con constraint. Okay. So now the uh, now it's related with so someone that in the limit mass going to zero becomes a massless beam new plus a new degree of freedom. A Stuckelberg field. Now, this new deg now this theory, of course, is uh, has gauge redundancy perfectly nicely because I can shift b mu nu by mu nu plus psi mu nu, no problem, and I can shift a mu by a mu plus x 
psi. That's it, okay? So the same thing that we are witnessing over and over again, we cannot break gauge symmetry because gauge symmetry is a redundancy. And what happens is that it always maintains itself. The best we can do to make some of the gauge parameters alive, make them physical, and then they continue to maintain gauge redundancy. Okay, they become Stokelberg fields. So now B mu nu now became massive, propagates three degrees of freedom. And who are these three degrees of freedom? These three are one plus two. So one was old B mu nu, and this one is Stuckelberg. So it's like a it's almost like a Higgs mechanism, okay? Except we don't have a Higgs boson, okay? Uh, it's almost like a Higgs mechanism, but if you want to discuss in the language of eating up, B menu has eaten up a vector and became a massive anti-symmetric two form, okay? Now, we got number three, three degrees of freedom. This should ring a bell because in the previous lecture, we showed that massive photon had three degrees of freedom, right? Now, again, if I map this to a representation of the Poincaré group, I should look for the candidates that propagate three degrees of freedom, and it's a massive photon, which means that this theory that we just wrote down here should be equivalent to a theory of a massive photon. Okay, now, how we make it equivalent? We make it equivalent by performing duality transformation, precisely the duality transformation that we performed before, okay? Except now, we have to dualize both, and this is your homework. By the way, I have to give you some homeworks. So, so, so now, if you have any questions or stuff, come and we can do it together, okay? Right. Now, now, but I will tell you the answer that you will get. So what you will get, you can suspect what you will get. Anyone suspects what you get if I dualize this, this story? Sorry? Sorry, say it again. Absolutely, yes, that's what you get. You get what we discussed yesterday, PROCA. You literally, if I dualize this, I will get PROCA. What will happen is that the vector will get dualized into a vector. Okay, just as, as you can see very easily, doing the same, exactly the same thing that I, I did for, uh, I did here. A vector gets dualized into a vector, and B mu nu gets dualized into a scalar. So this theory, when I dualize it, literally becomes dualized to Proca theory in which a vector eats up a B mu nu. Except what happens is that the places are exchanged. When we do duality transformation, the Stuckelberg becomes an eater and the field that was eating, eaten up becomes a Stuckelberg. So it's the other way around, sorry. The, the one who was eating becomes eaten, okay? All right? So the Stuckelberg and the, uh, and the main field, let's call it the main field, the master field, exchange places under duality transformation, okay? This is what happened. And this is generic, by the way. Uh, generic in, the, in those cases in which you can perform duality transformation. I mean, there are cases in which, for instance, I have, I have no idea how to do duality transformation. For instance, the fields that are not anti-symmetric, etc. They also have Stuckelberg fields, but they are, uh, yeah, I, the, 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 the story is a little bit different, a little bit different. Okay, questions so far? Um, so, in other words, schematically, to write it down, in this language, okay, so A mu was, yeah, in other words, what happens is that B mu nu, A mu, and the dual transformation go into, B mu nu goes into yesterday's goldstone, or, or, or if, you, if you want some, some uh, okay, yesterday's goldstone, we called it phi, right? Stugelberg. I don't want to use the A because of the reasons that will be, will be, will be clear. It goes here and a mu goes into uh, into a mu again vector. Okay, so this is what happens. This is the duality transformation. Okay. Okay, very good. So now we identified one way for b mu nu to become massive. 
Okay. Um, is this good enough for the Goldstone boson? Okay, in other words, you see the logic, right? I'm trying to first understand how to generate mass fluid of BMU, and then trying, well, I will try to map this mass generation on the story with, for instance, the, 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 the mass generation of the pseudo Goldstone boson by break, explicitly breaking the symmetry, okay? Now, um, so the question is, is this story good enough for that? In other words, if I want to think of BMU nu as somebody that is dual to axion, for instance, okay? Could this be a, 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 a correct direction to go in, in understanding mass generation of the axion? Now, to answer this question, okay, we have to, we need some guideline. We have to count number of degrees of freedom. When axion becomes massive, do, does it acquire any new degree of freedom? No, right? This means that when axion becomes massive, it doesn't acquire a new degree of freedom, it stays one degree of freedom. So if we started with one degree of freedom, it stays one degree of freedom. Here, no. What happened is that we started with one, we ended up with three. So this cannot be, this cannot be uh, a, a theory for mass generation of the axion in, in the gauge language, because axion is not acquiring new degrees of freedom. We have to look for something else, okay? Clear? Uh, questions? Okay, so we need to look for some, some mass generation of BMU nu in such a way that we are not changing number of degrees of freedom of BMU nu. Okay? That's, that's our task. So how to do that? Now, the, the, the guideline is that BMU nu is a field that exhibits gauge redundancy. So of course we cannot, uh, as we know very well, we cannot break the, the gauge symmetry or, or whatever. Gauge redundancy is telling us that whatever theory we'll write down for mass generation of BMU nu should be manifestly gauge redundant. So we need a manifest gauge redundant theory which would generate a mass gap without changing the number of degrees of freedom. Okay? Now, for a gauge Oh, for, but by, the, by now, from all the story that I explained yesterday and today, now we, we understand that these gauge fields, the, the fields when we write them in, in, in the in, in form of gauge redundant quantities, okay, they have two ways of behaving. A that they are master fields that require Stuckelbergs to eat them up and become massive, or they are Stuckelbergs themselves, okay. So therefore, we, we need to, to look for the situation when BMU nu will be, it's, itself will be a Stuckelberg field for someone, okay? But that someone should be very special because since BMU nu carries zero, sorry, one degree of freedom, that someone should not carry any degrees of freedom, okay? Because we don't want to change number of degrees of freedom. So we have to look for this type of object. And the story is absolutely beautiful, it, it also when implemented in QCD and uh, with Axion, etc. So what is, the, what is that type of object? Okay, there is such an object in three dimensions, okay? And it's a generalization of, of uh, with one more step, which we call a three form. Uh, let me see. So let's consider an object which has one more index, anti-symmetric with one more index, okay? So that object, uh, mu nu alpha, let's say. So let me call it a three form. And let me again write down a theory for a three form, okay? Um, so we, we we follow exactly the same same procedure. 
we inter we generate a let me call it uh, let me call it E for a moment. Okay. Uh, let me call it okay. Let me call it E. I don't know. Uh, okay, I'll which will be simply an anti-symmetrized field strength. Now the field strength of a three-form carries four indices, so we can also write it as a scalar. So anything with four indices, four anti-symmetric indices, we can write it as a scalar function in uh, in uh, in four dimensions, right? In three plus one dimensions. Okay, so this is the field strength, right? Again, uh, we write down a Lagrangian. <coughs> and of course, the theory um, that includes the field is de depends on the field strength of this form <laughs> exhibits gauge redundancy. So, now, what should we, we should, we should shift it by an anti-symmetrized derivative of a two-form. So, omega is some, some two-form with uh, two anti-symmetric indices, it's a gauge transformation parameter, G generalization of the gauge transformation parameters that we had before. Um, <coughs> now, again, let's study this theory, okay? So, we do, the, the, we follow the same steps. We fix, we fix the, um, we fix the gauge. By uh, choosing the gauge transformation parameter, then this leaves us a residual gauge freedom. Okay, uh, we kill uh, also, uh, so we first we eliminate uh, degrees of freedom on off shell, so whatsoever we eliminate them, then we eliminate them on shell. And we are left with uh, zero. Okay, so there are no yes. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, I mean, what I was I was saying. So we want to generate a mass gap in a theory, right? So we have two two theories. Okay, good that you you are asking. Let, let me repeat again the story, right? So we have a story here with uh, with axion A, and uh, so we have here a story with B mu, nu. and this is the version that is has shift symmetry, okay? And this is the version that exhibits gauge redundancy, okay? Now, uh, so now the question is, I want to understand whether I can extend this, this duality, this correspondence, okay, for the physically interesting cases, okay? So, in particular, I, I, I have in mind the first target is to understand the mass generation of eta prime, the Goldstone, whenever we have mass generation of the Goldstone bosons. Eta prime, mass generation of the axiom. So, which means that now I need to embed these theories, both of them, into a theory that generates a mass gap, okay? Now, um, this part of the story is clear, because in this part of the story, you, you already heard about uh, axions and everything, and we know that it's a, it's a Goldstone boson, and what we are doing is that we are generating terms in the potential without adding any new degrees of freedom, just simply terms in the potential, by integrating out instantons or whatever, okay, doesn't matter for this purpose, which generates a mass gap for A. And this generation of the one mass gap is not increasing the number of degrees of freedom. Okay, so we had A with one degree of freedom, okay, one, and then there is massive A, again, mass gap, again with one degree of freedom. That's it, so now I'm simply looking for the analogous way of generating a mass gap in theory of B mu nu, 
without the increase of number of propagating degrees of freedom. Okay, so now, I realize that this, this, this version is not good, because this version does generate mass, uh, of course, the, the, the generates a mass gap, but it's in, it is changing number of degrees of freedom. It doesn't matter in which basis you are. So, in other words, this, in the language of axion, this would correspond to a situation when you have a Goldstone boson, and you are generating this mass of the Goldstone boson through a Higgs mechanism, or a, pro, or a Proca mechanism. But that's, what, that's not what happens with axions, and that's not what happens with eta prime, okay? Uh, they don't acquire any, any partners uh, when they generate their masses. So therefore, this is not good, this, this way. And I'm looking for now something else that could be a better candidate. M maybe the answer will be negative. We don't know, right, yet. But okay, let's see. Okay, any other questions? Now, so C carries no propagating degrees of freedom, zero. Now, it doesn't mean that it's unphysical. Uh, it's, it's, so in this respect, um, uh, C, uh, three form in uh, three plus one dimensions, um, uh, three form in three plus one dimensions, three form, is very similar to a vector, a massless vector, Maxwell's vector, in one plus one dimensions, okay? Now, in both cases, the, the field strength carries the same number of indices as the dimensionality of space-time, and in both cases, this, with, the same, uh, with the same counting of, uh, of um, degrees of freedom, you can, you can see that the, the, the um, um, the field, uh, the, the, the Maxwell field in one plus one dimensions, so-called Schwinger model, right? Um, again, has no propagating degrees of freedom. But nevertheless, there is an electric field in one, in one plus one dimension. So the, the Maxwell equation in one plus one dimensions has a solution, okay? Has a solution, very nice solution, with an arbitrary constant electric field. Okay, so the, the electric field uh, actually, f nu nu being uh, simply a constant, uh, s some constant uh, uh, e t t times epsilon mu nu, okay? So, um, the, the, the way we can, okay, you, you can understand it very easily. So, the, the electric field in one plus one dimensions behaves in a way similar to an electric field produced by a infinite capacitor plate in three plus one dimensions. Okay, so if I have an infinite capacitor charge comp capacitor plate in three plus one dimensions, it produces a constant electric field. So what happens is that if you instead look for the charges, okay, in one plus one dimensions, um, so there is a, literally what, is what would happen in four, four plus one dimensions with a capacitor plate. So what happens is that there is a, so let's say we can choose this to be a static charge, Q, okay? And so the electric field has the following form, that there is a, let's say, so there is an electric field and there is a jump in the electric field, and the jump in the electric field, as you can see from this equation, is measured by the charge, okay? So there is a constant electric field produced on both sides with a jump, which is set by the charge, okay? So that's what happens. Now, of course, this electric field is, uh, of course, it's physical. So, in other words, the fact that uh, a mu in one plus one dimension doesn't propagate any degrees of freedom doesn't mean that it's unphysical, okay? In fact, it uh, could not be more physical. Uh, exactly the same is true for uh, a three form in uh, three plus one dimensions, okay? Now, uh, three form in three plus one dimensions, the equation of motion, which we, we get from here, which is literally a generalization of Maxwell. For example, a free equation of motion <coughs> uh, has a solution with arbitrary electric field, okay? Can be an arbitrary constant E, uh, proportional to epsilon tensor, of course. Okay? 
Now, this E is arbitrary. OK, so now the question, so what about the sources? So what are the candidate sources that are, can be sourcing this, uh, uh, this uh, three form? OK? Um, now, there is one uh, immediate uh, source that you can identify for, for, a, for a three form, which is a direct generalization of a particle. Okay, so now, um, so th let's take in three, in three plus one dimensions. Now we are in three plus one dimensions. Forget about this one plus one dimensional Maxwell field. Okay, so in three plus one dimensions, if I have a vector field, okay, vector potential. And I want to couple it to a, to a particle, right? So what, first of all, what are the sources for a vector potential? Even if I think classically. So let's say, let's say, let's think in terms of point particles, okay, classically, right? Um, what is the source? A particle, right? So particle is, is, is uh, creating an electric field. Now, why this is the case? Because um, particle, when it moves in the space time, It, it, it moves along its word line, right? So the particle has a characteristic history of embedding of a particle in three plus one dimensional space time is given by its word line, right? Okay. Now the word line of a particle, um, so let's say we introduce particles in the way that word lines have no beginning and no end, okay? So they are either infinite or closed. So for example, if you materialize particle out of the vacuum, a, a loop and whatever, the word line can be closed. So the word line has a characteristic of word line element. But it will be all, all off shell, right? No, if you do that like that, of course they are off shell. I mean virtual particles are off shell, right? Obviously. Uh, that's, that's absolutely correct. Now the so the A mu is the right object to be sourced by a word line of a particle, right? So we have word line of a particle, and we are sourcing A, and there is a coefficient of of, uh, of, of, of sourcing. So this is integral over one one plus one dimensional word line. This is the action of the particle, right? Of the particle. Okay. So <coughs> now <coughs> now we want to generalize this. Uh, to a g object with uh, three indices, okay? So, then you can immediately come up with, a, with, a, with, a, with, a, with a one version of the answer, because now I need to couple uh, three form to an object with a word volume, of course it will not be line anymore, okay? With word volume element with three indices, three anti-symmetric indices. What kind of object is that? Hmm? So this three indices. Three yeah, the word volume should have three indices. And uh, this object also be supposed to be some volume, corresponding to volume of the. Um, no, it has a volume. The, the, what I'm asking is that so particle has. This is orientated volume. What I'm saying is particle has itself has no dimensionality, right? Uh, uh, it's particle is point-like, so a word line is a line, right? Okay, so now, now instead of a line, the line will not be good because it only has one index. We cannot couple something with three indices to, 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 to a line with one, in, one index. So now we need an analog of the word line, but cannot be line, it should be word volume now, but with three indices, with three anti-symmetric indices. Of course, the word volume element is always anti-symmetric, obviously, but with three indices. What kind of object can you imagine? So let's go, step, let's go up, right, step by step. So if I have a string, Right? If I have a string, by the way, I wanted to say this about Bimu Nu, now it's a good, <laughs> good time to, to mention. So, if I have a string, string, has, string is not a particle, right? String is, has one dimensionality, right? When string moves in the space time, 
What kind of word volume does it have? Huh? Word sheet, right? So two, two, two indices, right? So therefore, string, the string is a good candidate to be sourcing the immune field, anti-symmetric tensor field. And by the way, that's why in string theory you have these people all, all around, okay? Because the fundamental string is a natural source for an anti-symmetric two-form, okay? So the string would be sourcing the menu. Now we, we need to go one step higher, okay, to be sourcing C, right, three indices. So we need someone with three word volume indices. Okay, what is that? Two brain, right? This is a, like a membrane. It's a two, two, it's a, it's a two brain. Two brain or a domain wall, okay? So in three plus one dimensions, that's a codimension one object, okay? So particle is a codimension three object, string is a codimension two object, and um, and this guy two brain is a codimension one object, okay? So therefore. Is literally like a capacitor plate. Okay, so it's like a capacitor plate uh, sourcing the electric field. The same is true here. Okay, so therefore, if I had such sources, so this is one possible source, not the only one. As we will see, of course, there are other sources that uh, be, can be sourcing uh, the a tri a three form, in particular the axion itself. Okay, but. Now the point is, okay, we notice that if I don't have sources, so, so far I'm in low energy effective field theory, okay? So I don't care about UV completion or whatever of the theory. So I'm in low, in low energy effective theory. And I, I discover that the solutions of equations of motion give me an arbitrary constant electric field, okay? Now, if there are no sources in your theory introduced that are interacting with C, then this electric field obeys a super selection, super selection rule. You cannot change it, okay? Because the, the only, you cannot change it either classically or quantum mechanically. Because to change an electric field, you need a charge. Now, if there are no membranes in my theory floating around, or other sources that we will discuss for uh, the three form, then we are, we are discovering the following thing, that a theory of a three form, which doesn't have electric sources, has a continuum of states, okay, labeled by a constant value of the electric field, and each of these states represents a good vacuum, because you cannot change it, either classically or quantum mechanically. You cannot, there are no transitions between, the, the, between, different, uh, be, between different vacuum with different values of the electric field. Now, if we, if we include sources, let's say membranes, uh, then uh, we could induce transitions between the different vacua, okay? By quantum mechanically materializing the, 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 the closed membranes, okay? So the, the process is, um, so you are familiar with Schwinger pair creation, right? In, in, uh, in, um, in, in, a, in an electric, background electric field. Everybody is familiar with this? Right. It's literally the same phenomena. It's ge literal generalization of the, the same phenomena. In other words, so in the case of uh, electric field, uh, there is a critical value of the electric field about which I can pay a create charges, okay? And now, uh, unless charges are infinitely massive, okay? So if charge is a finite mass, then there is always a critical value of the electric field about which I can pay a create charges, okay? So in this way, when I pair create charges, what happens? So I, ha I can have a constant electric field to start with, and then I can pair create a charge, anti-charge pair. Let's say like this, okay? 
and so and then they they can be they can move apart. Okay, so in this way I can transit from an initial. Uh, let's put this. I can transit from an initial value of the electric field to certain final fi final value. Okay, so I can have a load transitions for different values of the electric fields. Okay. But the transitions that are allowed are determined by what kind of charges you have in your theory, okay? So the charge can only give you a fixed step for the transition. Why? Because as we said, the, the change of the electric field is always given by a charge. So therefore, if you have in your theory a lowest possible, a, a certain charge, fixed value, if, or if charges are quantized, then there are transitions between the, uh, the different values of the electric field that are allowed. If you don't have charges, Nothing like this happens, okay? Uh, so, in 3 plus 1 dimensions, therefore, if we have um, a, a free form, and I, I assume for a moment that either there are no charges, no membranes, or they are heavy, so that at low energies, uh, I can, I, they cannot be materialized, then I am left with the following conclusion, okay? That in a theory with a free form, they are continuum of the vacuum states, right? And all of them are good. Moreover, this electric field has certain transformation properties with respect to parity. So what kind of transformation property? Is it parity even or parity odd? Well, there is an ep epsilon tensor floating around, right? So therefore, Odd, right. So this electric field is parity odd. So it's a funny object. You see what happens. It doesn't break uh, Lorentz boosts because it has, it's a scalar. It's a Lorentz scalar. It has four anti-symmetric indices or, or none, which is the same thing, right? For, 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 for. So it doesn't break space-time symmetry. It doesn't break translation invariance, other, but it breaks parity. Okay? So, in other words, a theory of a three form, so let's summarize. So, theory, theory of a three form, unless the, the, the sources are included in form, in form of membranes or something else, uh, the moment we wrote down a theory of a three form, this theory contains an infinite number of vacuum states. All of these vacuum states, except one, break parity. Their parity odd. Okay, so there is one special vacuum where electric field is zero, and that's a parity conserving vac vacuum. Uh, all the other vacuum are parity, parity violating. Now, this should ring a bell, right? This should ring a bell because this is already smells a strong CP problem in QCD, right? In QCD, we have exactly the same situation. We have um, theta vacua, all of them are good, okay? Uh, but only one is parity conserving. Okay? Actu actually, the, the connection is not an accident. Theta vacuo and QCD, literally, we can describe as this vacuo. Okay? QCD has all the machinery for this. Right? So that's why it's not an accident. Okay, questions so far? No, nothing, no questions, uh, you like, uh, everything is fantastic, or uh, you, 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 you could not care less, or I don't know what, <laughs> yeah. This thing happens in, in any dimension, if I use a... Uh, yeah, in any dimension you can have a corresponding... The same, the same number of indices. Yeah, uh, that's right, absolutely correct, yeah, okay. yeah. So in any, in, in any number of space-time dimensions, there is one object, which is sourced by co-dimension mm -hmm. one objects there, in that dimensionality. And uh, that object has this property. Yeah, absolutely correct. Yeah. You said this sweet form theory is very similar with the form plus form dimensionality. Yeah, that's similar, yes, absolutely. And then if I add uh, appropriate, appropriate uh, interaction term, and if I compute the loop integral to... If you add the interaction term with the fermion, you mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah very good, fantastic, yeah. If I yeah. evaluate the self finish correction, yeah. then the C is unmessy. Yes, absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. And actually, it turns out that exactly that similar thing is happening in QCD, except the thing is not coming from a simple loop, but the effect is the same. So the, the way, by, okay, let me, since you're asking a question, so in other words, in what, so what he is asking is this. 
So in one plus one dimension Schwinger model, there, there is this phenomenon of screening of the electric field. What happens? So if you introduce a massless fermion, okay, you compute one loop, and you see immediately that the electric field, uh, sorry, this one, becomes Higgs. So there is a one loop contribution to the electric field from the massless fermion in one plus one dimension. And this loop in one plus one dimensions generates a mass term for the, for the field. So, f the f sorry, <laughs> very dramatic. So, the, the, field, um, the field in one plus one dimension had no degrees of freedom, and the moment you introduced fermions, okay, this field became massive. It became a Proca field in one plus one dimension. So, it's a very, it's fanta it's, it's a fantastic phenomenon, right? This is the Schwinger phenomenon. So, this doesn't happen in 3 plus 1 dimension with a vector field. In the 3 plus 1 dimension, if you are introducing fermions, you are, at one loop you are not generating the mass for a, for a photon. This is peculiarity of 1 plus 1 dimensions. Why? Because of connection with the anomalies. Because in 1 plus 1 dimensions, the way you can understand it is you can also understand in the anomaly language. But let me put this aside for a moment. So his, his point was precisely this. If I introduce fermions, I, what happens is that electric field gets screened. Okay, let's, let's um, try to understand this. W what are the physical consequences of this fact? So in, you, we, are, we are in one plus one. Uh, so it's a, it's a bit, uh, so I'm answering in, very, in great details because this is very important, okay? Now, we are in one plus one. In, in one plus one, we have Maxwell. All right, and now I take this Maxwell and couple it to fermions. All right, so I introduce fermions through the covariant derivative, couple it to Maxwell, massless fermions, okay? Through this loop, I generate a mass. I integrate out fermions, and integrating out fermions generates <coughs> a mass for a, for a Maxwell field, so it becomes a tilde, okay? Now, okay, what are the physical consequences of this first? Let's understand physical consequences. And secondly, let, let's understand the meaning of this phenomena. Okay? How it is happening. Physical consequences. Well, immediately, we are now in a theory of Proca. In a theory of Proca, equations of motion no longer have any electric field. Electric field is strictly zero. There is no long-range electric field because we are in a theory with a mass gap, okay? So what happened? Immediately, the following happened. So we had, without fermions, we had continuum of vacua in one plus one dimensional theory. Again, very similar. There was one vacuum which was a CP odd, sorry, parity odd, sorry, parity, parity conserving, yeah. <laughs> and the others all were parity breaking, okay? Now, the moment that there were no transition between the vacua, despite the fact that they cost different energies because they have different values of the electric field, there is no, there is no, uh, there is no degree of freedom that could take you from one to the other. Okay, so that's why they they are they, they are theta vacua literally. Okay, so now when I introduced fermions, I observed that the mass got generated. And with this, which means that this vacuum degenerates, this vacuum super selection got broken. The vacuum got lifted, and there is only one true vacuum now, which is parity conserving. Okay? Fantastic. Now, however, a few questions. This, this uh, Proca field, of course, acquired the degree of freedom, because massive Proca field in one plus one dimension, so, okay, we can, we can see it very easily. Immediately we can see. If I take divergence of this, I get again Proca condition. Proca condition tells me that I could, I could have two, and I have now one. So there, there is one propagating degree of freedom. Where is this propagating degree of freedom coming from? OK? Well, what happens is that this field, A mu, now we know, right? On the other hand, I, I told you the story yesterday, which of course carries through in one plus one dimensions. So I know that in order to make field massive, I need to I need to eat up a scalar. I need a Stuckelberg degree of freedom. So where is the Stuckelberg degree of freedom coming from? Well, the only place it could come from is fermion bilinears. That's it. That's where it is coming from. 
Now, this, in one plus one dimensions, we are lucky because in one plus one dimension, there is this phenomena of so-called bosonization, okay? That the theory with uh, the massless fermions is exactly equivalent to a theory with this type of a scalar, okay? So there is one-to-one -one correspondence between fermion and the, and, the, and the fermion scalar and the fermion bilinear, okay? Through actually gamma five, the relation, okay? And so what happens in one plus one dimension is that when I introduce massless fermions, massless fermions, they form bilinear, fully fledged bilinear scalar degree of freedom, and that is eaten up by a vector field. That's a equivalent way of understanding this one loop effect, uh, Schwinger one loop effect, okay? Literally. So this is what's happening. Now, his question, I forgot the question, but I think the question was, <laughs> <right>. <laughs> The question was wh whether there is an analogy. So, the, yeah, the analogy is 100%. So what is happening with uh, with uh, the Schwinger uh, story, with uh, the vector field in 1 plus 1 dimensions, is translated in QCD, but not for a gluon, but for a three-form, okay? So three-form in QCD is doing things that are strikingly similar to 1 plus 1 dimensional uh, electric field. So what is happening is that as we will see, uh, I have to get there, right? But um, uh, so, for instance, if I introduce massless quark, the analog of this guy in QCD is eta prime. So what happens is the massless quark bilinear, which is eta prime, is what is eaten up by a three form, and this three form becomes screened. That's another way of understanding this massless quark solution of the strong CP problem. Right? So, no, no, in, an, in another language, we know that mass was crap because of the um, anomaly, etc. Th th that's the one language to understand it. And this is the e fully equivalent language. Okay? So, that's the answer to his question. Okay, other questions? All right, so th therefore, now let's see. Uh, we need it. So, okay, so now first I need to understand mass generation for this guy, uh, right? Uh, I was started to write it somewhere, but uh, in fact, if, if 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 okay, in the normal course, lecture course, it's useful to first describe Schwinger's story, and then. Okay, because the analogy is so striking that, but okay, we don't have time now to go into Schwinger in great details, although the story is here. Um, now, uh, so uh, I'm starting with this. Uh, and I'm adding a master. Okay. And um, the story here is over. Uh, first of all, we see immediately that uh, this is like a proca condition. And by the way, it's one to one with one, one plus one dimensional Schwinger story, okay? So it's like, okay, so there is a proca condition on, 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 on this field. And what, I w what we were achieving by, by gate choice is now achieved by, with, with proper condition, okay? And that's it. We no longer have yet another residual gauge thing to eliminate on, on, on shell. So there is one degree of freedom left, okay? Fantastic, because this is what is precisely smells like uh, axion story, because in other words, C got a mass, had zero, zero degrees of freedom, uh, acquired one, who is that one? Okay, we know who that one is. Again, I write it as someone that is smooth in the limit. Uh, when mass goes to zero, plus a field strength of a something that, let me call it B mu nu, okay? So, again, we are witnessing the same thing, the same phenomena. So there is a Higgs effect, or a Proca effect, okay? 
four, a three form, so three form, eight up, anti-symmetric two form, and became massive. So this guy had no degrees of freedom, zero. This is zero plus one equals to one. That's the, that's the phenomena. And this is, this is what we need, because, so uh, again, before we, I say what we need, uh, uh, let's finish this. So there is gauge redundancy, obviously, here, right? The original gauge redundancy that I wrote somewhere, this thing, this thing, is now fully maintained by B menu, by shift of B menu. Okay, so now these two, this continues to be true. So B menu here acts like a Stuckelberg for a three form. So in the previous example, B menu was a master field, it ate up a vector, became massive, okay? And here, B menu got eaten up by a three form and became massive, okay? But the important thing is that this phenomena is not changing number of degrees of freedom of B menu. Of course, it's changing number of degrees of freedom of, of a three form. Okay? Therefore, this tells us that this may, may be the correct way to understand mass generation for a scalar in a gauge redundant language. You see? And this is extremely important. I'm sorry. Yeah. This scalar is dual to B, it's not dual to C. Yeah, it's dual to B. I'm sorry, it's not dual, it's B itself. It's just a scalar, B. B we, 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 we show that B, any B that has this gauge redundancy is a scalar, right? So this is a fully fledged B that shifts under the, uh, under the uh, symmetry, uh, under the, uh, it shifts under more than what, n not, n not what naive B would, would do because it is a Stuckelberg for, for C now, okay? No, field strength, uh, yeah, field strength is just a field strength, right? So, field strength. This is what, what you say there, right? Yeah, degrees of freedom are, are, are associated to the, to the fields themselves, not to their field strengths. Field strength is whatever it is. But it's also constant. In which theory? No, here there is no constant field anymore. It's exactly. This is not related to that. This, this is what you had before. Uh, e, mu, alpha, beta, gamma. This one? Yeah. yeah. Is true still or no? No, no, it's not true. That's the whole point because the, the, that's precisely the point. The point is, in without B, without mass term, this was my theory, right? Okay? So this was my theory. And in this theory, the equations of motion, they had a solution with continuum po possibilities of a constant electric field. And there was, there was absolutely no way to either remove this electric field once it's there, because there is a super selection rule, uh, or change it by some quantum process or a classical process, okay? So it's like God-given, right? Now, now imagine, put yourself in, 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 the, in the shoes of an observer that lives in the universe with this three form, okay, right? So we, we, we live in the universe with this three form, okay? And we wake up in the morning, and imagine that we discover that the electric field in our universe is zero. We would have a puzzle, well, then we will make a conference, and then we will say that we have a parity problem in this universe. Why? Because we know that our theory admits continuum of the vacuum solutions, but miraculously we happen to live in the, in the one which has extremely small parity violation, or even zero. Okay? So that would be a literally analog of strong CP problem, Translated for the theory with the three form. Okay, now, now we are adding a mass to this. The moment we add mass, that's it. All these electric fields are gone. There is no longer a solution for this for the equation for the. Yeah, I didn't write an equation here, but okay, for the equation. This, you can check it very easily, that this doesn't have any constant electric field solution. Uh, so that's not surprising, we are in a theory with a gap. Theory with a gap cannot have a, with a mass gap cannot have a, any constant electric field solution. 
It has waves, of course. There are waves because now there is a there is a propagating degree of freedom that uh, that that is there, and so okay, you, you have some some configurations which are non-trivial, but no no constant electric field. Now, if you are in the shoes of uh, if you are an observer that lives in this universe, okay, and knows about this possibility, this observer would say, okay, wait a minute, there must be a new degree of freedom that acts like a Stuckelberg for my free form and therefore eliminated the constant electric field. And this observer would call that degree of freedom an axion. And this observer would be right. Okay? So this is now, our task is now to show how this happens in QCD. Okay? The whole story. Right? Okay, any question? Yeah. What for? What for? Based from formation. Yes, there is also thing about that. Well, okay. As you know, if we so, if our target is a strong CP problem in, in in QCD, as you know, in case of strong CP problem, that's not the question we are asking because the strong CP problem is formulated already when we say that there there are there are different vacuum states and all of them are legitimate. And precisely this, the origin of the strong CP problem is that in that version of a theory without axion or without massless quark. No there is nothing that could generate transitions uh, in between the different theta vacua, right? And so, they are the, the yeah, that's, that's how we formulate the problem. So we, we simply say that these vacua are, we know that they are God-given because they're, they're, they obey a super selection rule, and we are puzzled why we, why we happen to live in the one which, is, which has less, less uh, CP violation, less theta parameter, okay? Um, now, uh, if you have a theory which can address the question of f formation of this electric field, which would be equivalent of the question of selection of the theta vacuum, then you have a solution of the problem, or at least a potential solution of the problem. And that's, part, that's what Axion is doing. Axion is doing it in, in a dramatic way. It just simply says that all these vacuum are nonsense. There is only one which conserves CP, okay? It's too dramatic. But if you have some other way of selecting this, this vacua, uh, then maybe you can have a way to, to select them but not completely eliminate the, the other possibilities. Okay, so that could happen, yeah. I, I don't have such a solution, but yeah. Yeah. It's not clear to me why uh, this Lagrangian is the dual of the mass generation for axioms. Yeah, that's what we're going to discuss, yeah. Oh. Right. Uh, but uh, it's not a question of duality. See, so forget about duality. Here, the, the story was very. Con the question was very concrete and explicit. I wanted to understand to generate mass yes. for a B mu field without changing number of degrees of freedom. That was my my question, and this is the answer. Okay, but, uh, okay. I don't see why it generates mass for B mu. I see the mass generation for C, but not for B. No, that's a, that is semantics because look, here there is no C and no B. That's what I'm saying. There is only one object, which is C tilde. Yes. C tilde is a, an anti-symmetric free form uh, massive. Okay. Yes. Now, the, the whole story, song and dance, is now how we get, got there. And we got there by using Bimunu as a Stuckelberg. So, in other words, the statement is the following, that the theory of a massive three form of this sort is in the same time a theory of a massive two form. Now, you can call it a theory of a massive two form or a theory of a massive, uh, massive three form, it doesn't matter, they enter, they, it's like the same thing as, you see, the Higgs effect. Higgs effect, normally we say that it's a theory of a massive vector. But you can think, call, call it a theory of a massive scalar. That they, they enter both and they form the, the, two, the, the two degrees of freedom that in the massless limit would disintegrate. They come together and they form a new degree of freedom, a new field, and they are now different components of this new field. Okay? Right? So therefore, this is precisely my point. What I'm trying to explain is that this theory is a theory of a massive three form, and that's also a theory of a massive two form. But you have to remember that these two forms entered there as a Stugelberg. Okay? In, in, in a sense, the, the, the reason why this degree of freedom now has, can propagate is entirely because of Bimunu. Okay? 
Anything else? Okay, so let's 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 move on. Okay, so now um, let's go step by step. So from the, the precisely the question that you asked. Now we want to somehow from here we want to convince ourselves that this has anything to do with the mass generation, mass gap generation in QCD, either for eta prime or for axion. Okay. Ah, sorry. Now, let's do, let's do duality transformation step by step, okay? Uh, I, I gave you one homework, right? What was it? I forgot. <laughs> there was something. Do you remember? Yeah, okay. <laughs> then, okay, the, the another homework. Dual, dualize, do this step, okay? Which is totally straightforward. Just, okay, so we do the following thing. We will not dualize C. I don't know why I raised it. Um, anyway, okay, so C was C tilde. C tilde was C and plus DB, right? Okay? Uh, so don't touch C. Let's not touch C. Dualize B. And that we already did. We know what happens. So then we rewrite now theory in terms of instead of C and B, in terms of C and A, okay? Right, so, and so now, if you do this, you will find the following. Lagrangian of the following structure. Uh, so first, it's, uh, so, so actually we can, it's convenient to move to a dual Thing. Let me denote it by. Uh, okay, let me call it F. In other words, so this was an electric field. Okay. Um, in other words, let me move move to. Let me multiply this by epsilon tensor. In other words, in the form language, let me go to Hodge dual of this, and so then I form a scalar, and I can write everything in terms of scalar, right? So, so in other words, let, let's call it F. So F would be simply epsilon alpha beta ta 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 uh, A E alpha beta ta 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 right so this is this guy and so we can write down everything in in in, in terms of this F so in short notations F is uh, D C right D of C right or Hodge dual of D of C. Um, so now the Lagrangian will be E square as it was. But then when I do dual transformation, I'll, I could have guessed already what I get. OK, let's write it like this. Now, in other words, once I go to the description of A, this story becomes this, okay? Now, check it. Don't trust me, all right? Uh, so what does this describe? This describes, again, uh, three forms, square, okay? And then the interaction between three form and A. Now, the boundary terms that you, 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 you were mentioning, right? And also you. Now, you see, this is shift invariant up to a boundary term, right? Okay, so in other words, uh, so there is an interaction between A and E, and it is shift invariant up to a boundary term, right? Because if I shift A by a constant, I will get E, and E is just a total derivative, okay? Right? This is clear, right? I, I don't have to write it down. Now, this also tells us that a has a correct transformation, it's a consistency check, sort of. A has correct transformation property with respect to parity. Okay? So A is, is a pseudoscalar, right? Because E is a pseudoscalar, so A is also a pseudoscalar. Okay? Okay, so now in this language, yeah. Is the, the second E should be an F, right? Or, yeah. 
Ah, uh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm really sorry. This, I, I totally got lost with these notations. Yeah, no, this is f square and f. Sorry. Yeah. yeah the same, thing. same thing where? No, no. Of course, they are the same thing. But I just okay. Sorry. Yeah, I don't know why I went to f, but. Because this was a constant, uh, okay, here I don't want to necessarily be a constant. He, I, I said E was a constant part of the electric field, but here it could be whatever. So I changed the notation to F, yeah. Okay, so in other words, again, F is a, four, is a dual of four form, it's a dual of DC, okay, right? And A is a scalar, pseudo scalar, okay? Now let's see the, the uh, let's see the screening of the. So this is a theory. You can call it a toy theory if you want. As you will see in a moment, it's not such a toy theory. Actually, this is literally what describes this. So the claim. Okay, let's make a claim. Claim is that this Lagrangian captures the essence of mass generation for axion and mass generation for eta prime. Okay, depending whether you want to consider either prime or axiom. Now, here, so okay, of course, we have to explain that, right? That's, uh, and that you cannot probably, uh, I cannot give you that as a homework. So that's. Uh, um, so let's first see how, in this language, we solve the uh, strong CP problem of this toy model. Okay, right? So what are the equations? The equations are, if I do variation with respect to C, of oh, this theory, okay, so F is DC, if I do variation with respect to C, I will get an equation, which is derivative of F is zero, sorry, derivative of F is derivative of uh, A over F, uh, A over F, and Box A is F. Okay. So we get two coupled equations. So again, as I said, assume that here I have one half, etc. Okay. Now Let's stare at this equation. What are, we, what are we getting from here, right? Now, in the absence of A, in the absence of A, we are back to this, to this story, to the problem, right? If, if there is no A, in the absence of A, there would be a solution. If A were not there, then there would be a solution where derivative of F is zero, so arbitrary constant, okay? F would be an arbitrary constant, which we call E, right? And this would be your parity violating uh, vacua, okay? Now, what happens with A? Well, what happens with A, we can see it immediately. First of all, even without this first equation, you can see what happens with A. A is sourced by F, okay, which tells you that this theory cannot possibly have any vacuum other than when f is zero. Because if f is non-zero, then the, 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 uh, the uh, scalar has a source and it cannot be constant or time independent, okay? Which means that we cannot be in the vacuum, okay? So only Poincare invariant configuration by vacuum that this theory can have is when f is zero, is when f is zero, okay? This already tells you that this theory solves the, the parity problem because it will move until it will find the point where f is zero, and that will be the vacuum. Okay, so now we can see it in, in explicitly in real time. Okay, what happens? I can integrate out f, literally, because this is a totally trivial equation, right? Just one, one derivative. So this tells me that f is simply a over fa plus an arbitrary constant. Let me call this constant theta. Okay. Then we are. Then I can take this and plug it here, and I get one over fa and uh, 
Now, uh, one, one more remark. So, um, uh, so since we gave this uh, C and A canonical dimensionalities, right? So the coefficient here, A over FA is dimensionless, so the coefficient here should have dimensionality of the mass square, okay? Right, so, let, so let, let, me, let me work in units of that coefficient. In QCD, that, co that the coefficient of dimensionality of the mass square is set by the QCD scale, okay? So in other words, here, we have a, an object which goes like lambda square, okay? Which I'm just simply, I'm working in you know, units of that object, okay? All right? So then we have this equation. All right, so what, what are we learning from this equation? Well, we are learning from this equation that uh, many, several things. First, we are learning that the vacuum is where fa plus theta is zero. Okay? All right? Which is the same thing as f being zero. This is precisely what we got, okay? So from here. So we see immediately that the vacuum of the, the moment I couple the three form field strength with a pseudo scalar, okay? This pseudo scalar finds the way to, 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 to make this uh, field strength zero, okay? Secondly, this theory is a theory of a massive scalar, okay? Right? So if I now shift my scalar, so you give me an arbitrary theta you want, okay? The scalar will find the, the vacuum point, and then if I shift t a over fa by theta, okay, I can write down a theory of a massive scalar, right? In other words, this theta, I can call it now a fluctuation of a, in other words, let me shift it by theta, right? And then, now I will have, I, then I get rid of this theta, and then I have a massive. So, it's a theory of a massive pseudo-scalar, massive axion, literally, okay? So it's a theory of a massive pseudo-scalar with the mass given by one over, but with the mass square, ma square, given by one over the uh, um, axion decay constant square, okay, in QCD units. Or if I restore QCD scale, it would be something like, okay? Now, th this is, the, of course, is the physically the same, same thing. It doesn't matter whether we, you, we use B mu language or we use axion language, or we use this language, right? It's the same physical effect, uh, except Uh, this is, we are m m trying to make the story more and more like conventional axiom story, okay? That's what I'm doing. I'm moving towards n normal conventional axiom language, okay? Okay, I, uh, how much time do I have? Well, we are over everything, right? Ah, sorry, yeah, so, so, sorry. Yeah, okay, sorry, yeah, then I should stop here and we continue tomorrow, right? Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, qu questions if you have any. Then. Uh, so what does uh, the story mean in the freeform and deform of the respective of the scalar? It seems that it's masochistic to describe a scalar with something like bring this uh, What is uh, sorry, say it again? Which what what is the story? So uh, we saw that we can describe the scalar with just uh, object A without any indices. So what does the story when we describe it like an object with three indices up? Uh, you, you mean, so this, the, the, the scalar, yeah, so there were two gauge objects, right? B mu nu and C mu nu alpha. Yeah. Right, so, and your question is? Why do we need to describe, why do we need an object with this many indices to describe a scalar when we can just use a scalar? <laughs> no, you, we can, of course, you, you can use a scalar and then you will not learn anything. <laughs> I mean, you just, uh, you can always use a scalar. So here the whole point is to try to understand mass generation of, of, for, the, for that, not for any scalar. The target is uh, axion or eta prime. 
So we want to understand mass generation of the axion and interprime in the language of gauge redundancy. Why? Because the language of gauge redundancy then gives you a lot of power. And certain things that, that are not transparent in, this, in, in the language of a scalar, in the language of gauge redundancy, become extremely transparent. For example, I don't know, how to control gravity and this kind of stuff. I, I didn't get there yet. So, yeah, it's a question of understanding. I mean, we are trying to understand. That's why we jump around with indices and write equations. It's a standard story, no? I'm not... Okay, but isn't yeah. gauge redundancy something that just us not being able to write down something with the correct number of degrees of freedom and we make up like a quote-unquote mistake in why too many that we have to have constraints to remove the extra ones? Well, okay, so the, the, yeah, I started these lectures by, by, by saying that what, from our experience with quantum field theories, what we are learning, okay, we learned long ago, but that um, theories with, uh, with indices, the moment I write down fields with Lorentz indices, as some kind of tensor fields at least, okay, they can, uh, for example, spin one and higher, they all exhibit gauge redundancy, okay? So the formulations that we know of this theory, how to deal with these theories, they are gauge redundant. Now, this, of course, touches uh, deep questions, like, for instance, as you said, is gauge redundancy uh, fundamental, or is just our inability to, uh, to, to, to find good variables? But if inability so you see, at some point, in inability becomes fundamental. When you try a lot, a lot, and it doesn't work, then you say, okay, wait a minute, should be something fundamental here. Now, so th there is this question, yes, independently, right, whether gauge redundancy is fundamental. Th then the, the other things are, what can we learn ga from gauge redundancy, and whether we can use gauge redundancy to control things. Th these are the questions that we are trying to answer and apply for these particular situations. So, in other words, here the story is to first to understand uh, the same physical phenomena in different languages, okay? And then see whether in s some description gives us some advantage for understanding things better than in the other description. So, this is sort of a big picture about this. Like, as, as I said, I mean, good examples of this are, are Axion and Eta Prime are ready-made for, for this kind of discussion. That's why I choose them as a target. But of course, this story goes beyond. It goes to brains and strings and whatever, right? Uh, I don't know if I'm answering your question because I don't understand the question. But so, I, I mean, in any case, I mean, the, 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 here's the story is about try understanding. Right, yeah. Uh, as we will see, for instance, I mean, uh, the, the you can understand generations of um, the, the mass gap. You see, in standard languages, you, people had to go through a lot of heroic efforts. Like, you know, you have to understand, Toad came up with a determinant. Then, we, 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 then he showed that if you integrate over instantons, you generate this determinant. Then people use dilute gas approximation, etc., etc. Okay? So sometimes you have to go through a lot of pain to, to get a result. And it, in many cases, gauge redundancy can allow you to, to get, at least, see the f effect through, okay? Right? Uh, so, yeah. Okay, anything else? Yeah. I'm, I'm not entirely clear. Why does the equation for A have to imply that, why does A have to drive F to zero, I guess? Um, so, this is the so, this is the equation, right? Now, this equation describes, uh, think in the following way, right? So, this equation describes a scalar, right, with a source. Now, the source itself could be a function of a scalar, okay? Right. But, obviously, in other words, so, okay, it could be useful to put it on the other side. We can, we can write it like this, right? Now, obviously, if the, if the right-hand side is non-zero, the left-hand side cannot be zero, right? Which means that your field A should be a space or time dependent which means that you cannot be in the vacuum. So as long as left-hand side of this equation, uh, sorry, right-hand side of this equation is non-zero, A cannot be in the vacuum, which tells you that the moment you introduce A, this theory either is a nonsense or it has a vacuum where F is zero, okay? Okay, you, of course, you could, a priori, it could happen that it has no vacuum, but then immediately you see that it has a very nice vacuum, 
Okay? The moment you solve first equation, plug it here, you see that there is a beautiful vacuum, and this theory describes a massive scalar. Now, the miracle, you see, it's a, in the standard axion picture, right, there could be one sort of something that looks like a miracle. Why? Because you say, okay, I have this axion. Okay, this axion somehow couples to FF dual. Now, then I integrate over instantons, and miracle happens, and the potential that I generate for axion for, from the instantons is exactly where the CP is concerned. But now you can say, okay, how can this miracle happen? Right? But here we see that that's not a miracle. Here we see that it's a very simple thing. The, 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 the CP violation is because you have a non-zero non electric field. And the moment you introduce degrees of Stuckelberg, degree of freedom that kills this electric field, that's it, you are done, okay? So all the song and dance of instantons, et cetera, et cetera, in this language sums up in this Lagrangian, and that's it, okay? Right. Okay, nothing else, to, and then uh, let's see something, right? <laughs> <laughs>